Hello and welcome to our webinar today. I'm Josie Sutcliffe. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at Biblio and will be the moderator for our webinar, uh, which will cover the topic of digital content and unlocking that black box. Um, our two presenters are James Wiley, um, Principal Analyst with EduVentures, and Shannon Meadows, who's our Chief Revenue Officer here at Biblio. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first is that you can ask questions at any time through the webinar just using the chat. Um, so please drop in your questions and we'll try to answer them throughout as we go. Um, as well, we are recording this webinar and uh, we'll be making that available to attendees afterwards. Um, and finally, we really encourage you to connect with us through LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we'd love to make some new connections here today. So with that, I'm actually going to pass off to James Wiley to start his presentation, and you'll be hearing from Shannon a little bit later on in the session. James. Thank you, Josie. I'll introduce myself first. So principal as for technology, as Josie mentioned, um, I've been at EduVentures for, for coming up to seven years. I've been in, high, in education for more than 20. My role before was around assessment. It was in K-12. It was technology, data integration, software integration, et cetera. And since then at Edge Ventures, I've been focused on really helping institutions align their technology with their goals and trying to unpack some of the noise and, and, uh, and challenges that are out there in the ed tech space. So that's what I've been doing and that's what I continue to do and I direct the research at Edge Ventures. So with that, I'll just start and dive right in. So we're gonna to talk today about digital content and engagement, and it is challenging to do that. So I wanted to start with what the current state was. What do we know about the current state? So the first thing we know is um, that it's vague. There's a lack of consensus around what engagement actually means. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. We don't also know about some of the relationships between engagement and retention. Some literature out there points that there are links. Some say it's kind of fuzzy, kind of difficult. So overall, there's um, a, a lack of consensus. There's a fair amount of confusion about how student engagement connects to digital technologies, connects to retention, connects to student success, et cetera. So lack of consensus there. So we'll talk more about that in a second. But one way you see on the next slide, one way that's often done is just to measure engagement in terms of engagement with the tool, with the solution, right? So Indiana University, as you see here, this is from a while ago, has been exploring student engagement with e-text, with digital content. And you see, they look at it in terms of the platform, the devices, students, texts, et cetera. That's what I call thing engagement, right? Where we measure an engagement with a singular thing, and we look at that in terms of, and we try to look at that with the, through the lens of, well, are students engaged? Are they performing? Are they succeeding? This engagement is worthwhile, but as we'll talk about in a little while, this is not really the full breadth of engagement that needs to be um, undertaken in order to really understand how digital content engagement relates to student success and others. So where should we go? Right. So what's the future state? And if you look at some work that's done in the UK, and we'll see that on the next slide, where for them in this particular work um, called What Works, student, Ret student Retention and Success Program, engagement is really the glue. The engagement is what ties together um, all academic, social, service success, staff capacity, um, uh, institutional management and coordination, student capacity. It's the thing that brings it all together. Um, this view, which was kind of a work they've done for a while, showed that nurturing engagement during different spheres, academic and social and professional services, is really important to promoting student success. And within all of that, there is the role of digital content. It's engagement with digital content. So. One thing that we do when we talk to institutions is to think about, help them think about the role of engagement when it comes to student success, whether that success be academic, whether it be retention persistence, whether it be um, uh, something else, but nonetheless, think about the role of engagement 
in that, making students feel like they belong, they can be engaged with faculty, with tools, with other students, with content, et cetera. So this is the future state. This is one that we would like to get to. But what are the challenges? What prevents us from getting from where we are to there? And there, there are a few challenges. So the first challenge is, as I mentioned before, engagement. Often when we talk about engagement, we're talking about the thin engagement I mentioned before. I sometimes talk to vendors and call themselves engagement tools and pretty much they're texting tools and that's it, right? So I text you, we've been engaged, awesome. But engagement is more, right? How do we know there's a bunch of things involved in the outputs of education with what, right? Whether I'm engaging with learning processes, whether it's students, with faculty, et cetera, how am I engaging? Is it cognitive, is it behavioral? And then what are the ends, right? Retention, et cetera. Engagement is more robust than just the thin engagement identified before. So the first big challenge is getting our heads around what engagement actually means. The next challenge is understanding how we measure, right? Some work in the literature out there is very similar to what IU, as I showed before, does. It measures login times how students are interacting with the actual content in terms of memos, underlines, highlights, um, how they're moving through the site, next, previous, how long are they on the site? And that's fine, it's 100% fine to do that. But if we're going to measure true engagement, these aren't going to get us there. We're gonna need something more. The next challenge is understanding the scope of the engagement, right? So what you see here is probably, in my view, the best framework for teaching and learning that, that exists out there. And it's, it's from, as you see before, the ICOBA reference model. And it shows three big buckets, right? You have the educational activities on the left. These are kind of um, how the students are learning. The content on the right is with what are they you know, engaging with the content. And it all comes together in some sort of shareable resource. But we can think about um, engagement across all of this. As students, for example, are in, involved in different pedagogical approaches, activities, they may be engaging with content differently, okay? So thinking about the full scope of that, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, who does that at the institution? Is it just in the classroom or is it outside the classroom, perhaps with libraries? The, the last challenge is digital content types, right? We're talking today about textual on the lower right, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of other digital content out there that are being deployed and is being deployed in teaching and learning, right? Images, audio, movies, um, data sets, other things like that. And we're really, as an industry, just talking about this one on the right, but understanding the different kind of content types that are there. So these are the big challenges that get us from our current state to our future state. Um, challenge one is kind of just understanding engagement. Challenge two is understanding how to measure. Challenge three, understanding what the scope of teaching and learning is and where engagement actually fits and where digital content actually fits. And the last is identifying what the digital content types actually are. So what can we learn? What are some best practices there? And there are two big ones we see in our literature. The first one is to think engagement with digital content. Think of it as part of learning analytics. This is a vague term, um, learning analytics, so it's one that's often understood. A good definition, we think, is the one provided here, um, that is designed for instructional staff. It really supports educational aims and objectives, and it really is focused on engagement and academic achievement, right? Most analytic solutions focus on just the bottom, the how, they tell us about our predictive modeling, et cetera, or the, um, the what, I can bring data from this place and this place, but, when it comes to learning analytics, that's important, but what's really important is the why and the who, right? That's where learning analytics differs from other types of analytics. So one piece of, one best practice might be to think about student engagement with digital content as an input to your learning analytics initiatives, right? That's the first best practice. And the second best practice is thinking of it as part of an overall ecosystem. Right? And as we can see on this slide, the next slide here, we can kind of look at it as something that fits as part of an overall ecosystem. This is taken from an example, um, as you see below, they're really talking about open textbooks, but it's applicable outside of that, where 
you think about the learning analytics, let's think about the engagement, let's think about the measurement, let's think about the different types, and you're combining that and joining that with other data so that you get a full picture of student engagement and also retention, other forms of student success, right? So this is a different way of looking at it instead of looking at it as a standalone in a thin way. So we're, we're not saying you just measure clicks, et cetera, and you just don't measure it for one type of digital content. You actually expand it, treat it as an input to learning analytics, best practice one, best practice two, you think about it as a part of an overall ecosystem to help you inform and improve teaching and learning. And with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, um, Josie, who will introduce um, Shani. Thanks. Apologies, I got a little happy there with moving the slides. <laughs> Um, I'd now like to introduce Shannon Meadows, who will be taking us through the next few slides. Um, first, a really quick introduction to Biblio, just so you have some context there for those that are new to Biblio, um, and then moving into a discussion around uh, digital content within the learning ecosystem. Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon Meadows, and I wanted to transition now from the uh, context that James set for us and talk a little bit more about many of these topics in the context of the work we do at BibliU. And BibliU is a learning enablement platform, uh, and our focus is on helping to improve student outcomes in the context of making content more accessible, affordable, and engaging. And we do that in a number of ways. First of all, making it affordable, we guarantee the lowest prices, including lower than Amazon, uh, and we focus on ease of access. So um, accessibility, uh, also uh, availability on any device, any any device, anytime, anywhere, offline or online, and a very, very easy user interface. We've done a lot of work with students to get their feedback on the platform, and we've modified the platform as a result of that. And what we find is, uh, compared to other platforms, ours uh, uh, requires very, very little tech support for students, although we're happy to provide the support and the training, but very few calls come through in that regard. We also keep the price low enough that, that institutions can add auxiliary revenue if they choose to do so, maybe add five or $10 per book to cover student programs that auxiliary revenue typically covers, things like scholarships for students or childcare. And then finally, we support all types of content, including OER to reduce the cost even further or courseware, which we know many institutions use. So at this point, we wanted, because a lot of um, engagement involves content, we wanted to, to um, ask in terms of textbooks, how many, uh, a poll uh, to the audience, how many students at your institutions buy their textbooks, uh, because that is certainly a challenging element uh, in the uh, digital ecosystem. Did you have that poll you wanted to share, Josie? Yes, if we can put the poll forward, I just have uh, some support in the background here. There we go. So how many students at your institution buy their textbooks to your knowledge? And while uh, everyone's answering that poll, uh, I wanted to, um, talk a little bit about um, digital content in the context of the learning ecosystem, which is relevant for to what James had said before um, uh, regarding um, it not being a standalone element, but fitting in to the learning ecosystem. So I think we're all very familiar now with uh, how um, digital content can be accessed within the learning management system. Um, either OER, courseware, or digital books. And from that, um, uh, we can take advantage of the, uh, the analytics that not only are available for uh, digital course materials, but, but integrating those analytics with the learning management system in ways like 
uh, integrating the grades into the grade book of the learning management system or utilizing APIs to then link the data to other uh, data sources and show them in a broader uh, institution dashboard uh, where you can combine um, student engagement with the book, use of the book, in addition to things like um, SIS information about demographics and history of the student, uh, and, and thereby potentially predict their, um, their ability to succeed or the help that they may need. Can you go to the next slide, please, Josie? So, uh, one of the things we like to do uh, when we're thinking about how to make the, the uh, platform as, as user friendly and effective for students and for institutions as we can is to think of it in this framework of understanding the learning journey. And so the learning journey at a basic level, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with is the, um, information transfer, so a professor provides information, or in other ways information is shared, and then the student has assignments, you know, readings or resources they consume, and then their understanding is assessed uh, through uh, quizzing or testing, and then uh, grades and outcomes are the way we note whether they've, they've succeeded. And one of the main things we did early on with um, digital content was to make sure that students had access. That was the initial concern that, uh, that we had. Uh, they had access in online classes through the LMS and on ground classes. We focused on accessibility for students with disability. And we assumed that um, that was the most important thing. In addition, also um, access online or offline uh, so they didn't have to have internet connection at all times. Could you go to the next slide, please? And so what we have, uh, have learned is that access doesn't really equal learning in the learning journey. Um, we do provide the resources for students, but a large percentage of the students don't actually do the reading. And when they don't do the reading, they don't do as well um, uh, uh, persisting in, in school. Uh, and interestingly enough, we just uh, recently did a quantitative study with one of our institution-wide customers using universal learning. And uh, they, uh, they noted that the students who actually did the reading, which were uh, evidenced in the analytics, because we can see the reading, actually did better in, with their grades. So their grades were improved when they did the reading. We also did some qualitative um, surveys with those same students and the students who particularly those that were economically disadvantaged noted that they would not have purchased the book. They couldn't afford to, to purchase the book. So it really helped them that the institution did provide these course materials for them. So, um, what we, um, what we do to try and address this to, to James's point about engagement is we, we attempt to address it by um, uh, making more engaging content. And so there are three ways in which we do that. Uh, one is to make sure there's interactivity through social learning. So students have more confidence in the material they've learned, both uh, communicating with their peers and also with the faculty member. We also are focused on driving the right behaviors. So we, we provide uh, quizzes and interactivity in the text because we know then that causes, that are required. So that, that causes them to, to actually use the text. And there's also um, nudging reminders to actually do the work that we've asked them to do. And that again is driven through analytics because we know whether they've done it or not based on the activity that's recorded uh, with the system. Can you move to the next slide, please, Josie? Thank you. So the... Um, so Biblio has recently announced a new product, which we call Engage. Uh, and it's, it's very different in that it's an overlay interactive 
uh, interactive tool, which um, uh, can be used with any content. It can be used with publisher content or with OER. And one of the biggest challenges with, with these sorts of tools, uh, many people use courseware, you know, uh, publisher tools like um, um, Pearson My Labs or MindTap from Cengage, but those are only provided with a subset of course, uh, course content. For all the other course content where you might want more engaging material for your students, there's a lot of work that a faculty member or instructional design department would have to do to add the interactivity to that content. So with Engage, what we do is we use um, AI to provide an initial set of quizzing and questions, as well as subject matter experts. But of, of course, the faculty member or the institution can add their own questions uh, or modify those if they prefer to do so. But the idea is to make it um, scalable because it doesn't have to be done manually every, every time. And the elements that are included are social elements. So students can interact with each other, faculty members, grading for all subjects, different types of quizzing and grading for all subjects, including the humanities. And then of course, uh, analytics, which have uh, the nudging and the ability to report back to student success coaches or faculty members, how students are, are doing. Josie, if you would buy one quick question there about the interactivity is great. And thank you for pointing both on this slide and the previous slide about the interactivity um, that the, the functionality that you're providing. Um, what else, what other elements are you thinking about adding in the future to this? And also, how do you know that these are the right levers to pull, right? Because engagement is tricky. Um, how do you know that these will actually drive engagement? Well, we know that they drive engagement based on certain studies that have been done, which, uh, which do indicate that that engagement, uh, that improved performance occurs when engagement, uh, when we ask students to do more. I guess it goes back to the question of how you actually define engagement, but uh, certainly um, students do better when they are um, when they are encouraged to actually use an interactive tool and they're graded for actually using the tool. Like perhaps that we have uh, clients who uh, might give 10% uh, of the grade just for using the, um, the interactive courseware tool, which then derives better, better grades for, for the right. student right. overall. Okay. Uh, and then we also work interactively with our clients to get their feedback. So they'll tell us if uh, it, what works, what doesn't work, and what we need to modify, and we're, we're happy to do that. Um, it's um, a little bit of a tangent, but uh, in one case at the University of Phoenix, which has adult learners primarily, we got feedback that the students wanted more interactivity and more uh, capabilities in the text-to-speech function. Mm -hmm. So they uh, preferred to consume the content uh, uh, via the audio, uh, audio capability while they might be doing other things like driving, for example, or commuting. And so we did, we changed it to be much more like an audible type tool because that was uh, something they found uh, very useful. Sure, thank you. Sure. And this is, uh, uh, rel this is related to what uh, James just asked about, which uh, are uh, the studies that do indicate that engaging content can boost student course completion and performance. So there was a study done by San, um, San Diego State University and Pearson mm -hmm. that um, addressed uh, in-book chat and uh, correlated that to uh, that participation to uh, increase completion of assignments. Also that um, uh, at Coursera, they did a studies relative to um, graded assessments and behavioral nudging that caused uh, increased completion of courses. And the study you mentioned, uh, the San Diego State, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, talked about enrolling the, their courseware, their courseware tool with 
SIS, LMS data, et cetera. And I know you mentioned that before as something that Biblio um, enables. Are you seeing institutions actually do that, use Biblio in that way to, or are they still thinking about Biblio as I'm going to measure engagement in this rather thin way? There is a mix, actually, of what we're seeing. Um, some institutions are very concerned with um, integration into the learning management system gradebook so that they can automate, um, uh, automatically pull the data in and combine it with other data. Sure. Um, but there are situations, absolutely, where institutions have the data, but perhaps don't have the resources or mechanisms to, yeah. to use the data by uh, perhaps they don't have the resources to reach out to all the students. Some do, some don't. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Great, thank you. Sure. So this goes to exactly what it was you were you were uh, commenting about uh, earlier, James, is how digital content fits into the uh, teaching and learning ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's unique about uh, Bibli Biblio's experience is we we started as a company in the in the UK and then evolved uh, three years ago into the United States market. And in the UK, most of the bookstores on college campuses have gone out of business and the library is now responsible for distributing textbooks to students. Mm -hmm. And this is something very different than how, how things operate here in the US. So it's naturally pulled the library more into the uh, digital content uh, ecosystem. Uh, so James, I, you had mentioned that you had some recent experience working with librarians in that regard. Sure, absolutely. I was talking to a librarian. Uh, uh, my first engagement with a librarian was a few years ago on this topic. And um, she had personally dumped, been dumped upon uh, with all of the OER and digital content because no one else could handle it. Um, so she was trying to sift through it and really wanted to be part of the teaching and learning life cycle, right? Or ecosystem. We really wanted to be there when planning was done, when curriculum was put together, um, when delivery, when measurement was there. Because that's she was, these were her tools, right? She was owning this digital content. And I've heard more and more from librarians to, you know, this desire to be part of the teaching and learning. Don't be an afterthought or something ancillary to be part of it some more um, because they feel, and I think they rightly feel, that the content they possess, textbooks and um, digital content and et cetera, is vital for teaching and learning. And together with instructional designers, with faculty, et cetera, they can actually do something quite creative and quite powerful. So I'm hearing more and more from institutions, for institutional librarians, this desire, and I'm also seeing it moving slowly. Um, that institutional designer, um, instructional designers are consulting with libraries as part of their cost planning and cost development. And the interesting thing about that too, James, I've seen exactly the same thing. Many uh, librarians are now involved in, in um, this drive to, to use less and less expensive content using OER and are in the role of curating. Uh, you know, more uh, uh, librarians are, are being brought on to curate OER and help faculty members select the right content for their for their areas of, of instruction. Right. And yeah. yeah. And um, one of the things that we did uh, innovated to help librarians is we developed a new um, model, a new business model. You wouldn't think of a business model being an innovation, but in this case, we took a typical librarian, uh, a library model, um, which, which enables a pool of content to be used by users. And that we call a user activated acquisition. So only the content that is being utilized is what is purchased. And that's been available to librarians for a long time as multi-user content. But textbooks typically aren't available in that model mm -hmm. uh, in multi-user uh, uh, um, 
uh, licensing. They are available only in single user licensing, but we developed a way to actually make the textbooks available in this um, user activated acquisition content pool. And so it effectively enabled librarians in the UK to be able to work within their budgets and provide the textbooks that were needed for the students. And uh, we did some work here in the United States, similarly with the digital textbook reserves. So during COVID, uh, institutions weren't able to either be open or use hard copy books. And in that case, the uh, librarians were able to provide digital textbook reserves for their students. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's see, uh, next slide, please, Josie. And this slide and the next couple of slides show the types of analytics that are available with, with BibliU. We have, uh, and this is really what uh, you referred to, James, what we might call the thin analytic, the thin engagement uh, mm -hmm. metrics. Uh, and this is the uh, individual student overview. So you can see the heat map, um, the students that are using, you know, using, doing more reading than others. And then also feature usage, just like you brought up, which are things like uh, reading time highlights, mm -hmm. um, favorites, notes, and um, the use of reference, uh, referencing capability in text to speech. And one thing, though, I have heard uh, uh, that's an uh, effective way that this is put to use is um, student accountability uh, in the case where a student might explain, you know, uh, be unhappy with a grade, for example, um, then a faculty member could say, well, you you might not have done the reading. If you had done the reading, perhaps you'd do better or checking yeah. in with um, checking in with the student on um, where they stand a uh, third of the way through the class if perhaps they haven't uh, done the reading relative to how much other students have done the reading in the class. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, this is a, a further example of where you can see the average reading session, for example, in this case between nine and 11. Uh, minutes and I again per session and I feel like this which is actually pretty low when you think about it right that's a that's a short reading session <laughs> but it's uh, not that unusual I'd say they they vary you know from 10 to 45 minutes depending mm -hmm. and if we move uh, to the next slide I think this is really noteworthy and this is the uh, uh, actual uh, analytics on the book usage. So other than the student usage, are the books that are being used for the classes actually um, being read and being utilized? And I don't think there's a lot of work that's done around the ROI of the actual reading or uh, reading textbook content that's selected. And this enables um, uh, administrators and faculty to see which books are being used the most that's the bottom image, but the top image is actually uh, page and chapter usage. Um, mm -hmm. So the darker areas are those that are being used more. Any thoughts about that as a, an educator, uh, James? No, I like former it. Former educator. I, I, I know, exactly. Yeah, I was an adjunct for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have loved to have had this um, then, but uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case so many years ago. I did have, I mean, I, one of the things that some of your competitors have talked about, and theirs is not as, as rich as yours here, but they have talked about using this for procurement, meaning uh, an institution upon buying courseware um, or signing up for courseware can use this to see whether they should get it again, whether they should buy it again, whether they should extend the subscription, et cetera. I never really understood why you would use this analytics for procurement only. But are you thinking about, I mean, are you hearing institutions looking at something like this to see, well, is it that, should the institution actually just retire this content or not? Is that something that's there? Uh, you know, I have not, um... I've not particularly looked, uh, worked with procurement leaders in that regard, okay. but I have had um, a provost from a, a large um, online university mention that they do want to assess 
uh, that I think they'd like to look at it as they rework the courses, how yes, the books yeah. themselves are being used. That's and then, yeah. And in other cases, also, I've uh, ha had people state that the books are used less than they expected once they had all the analytics pipeline completed, both the uh, content analytics connected through with the learning management system. Mm -hmm. And rather than saying they didn't want the book, they felt they would reevaluate the course itself, uh, right. whether the, yeah, the way the course was using the book uh, was effective. Mm. Got it. No, thanks. Thanks. Yeah, it, it is interesting it, uh, with the amount of analytics that is uh, that is available now. There's so much of it. It's amazing yeah. that it's not more functionally used to solve some of those business problems. And I think yeah. that's a real area of opportunity for us. Yeah, I know. I definitely I definitely made mistakes when I was teaching about the sequencing of things. You don't never start with Shakespeare it just kills it. <laughs> um so um, that was a big problem yeah yeah yes Shannon, so we do have one one question um from the uh -huh. chat which was mm -hmm. um around um how how you um who you see as getting access to analytics and the role of privacy in using this data james do you want to address that or i can start whatever you can start to jump in afterward. Yes, that's great. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's interesting because we do work on both sides of the pond, so to speak. And in the UK and Europe with GDPR, the thinking and legality as far as privacy and data is entirely different than it is here in the US. And um, in the UK, there is interest uh, in using the data, it's much more oriented around anonymized data. Mm -hmm. uh, and here in the US, there's a lot of interest in and uh, practice of providing faculty members uh, with only the data for students in their courses. And we link the, use the um, LTI integration to identify the role of the um, instructor and which um, students are in those classes. And if the instructor uh, takes on that role in their institution, they can use the, those data to reach out to students uh, and, and um, uh, help them if they note that, they, that they're that um, they having trouble. And I think the work that you're doing in the UK sets you up quite nicely for what's probably to come here in the US. We, we, we don't have a national data privacy framework or law or anything like that. We're still scattered across a number of different um, regulations. But one of the most powerful aspects of GDPR is the idea of the right to be forgotten, right? The student can say, I request not just to opt out, but I request that you get rid of any data attached to me, which requires that any student data where it's used is traceable, right? Because the student's saying, get rid of it. Um, and I think that's, um, I think it's going to arrive in the US, it may not be formal, but I think some students might press that. There have been some anecdotal stories of students um, requesting that as of uh, from their institution's LMS, for example, um, or just requesting ownership of the data. You tell me what you're doing with my data, because one other thing about GDPR is that you, as the subject, you own it, right? You, you basically say, don't do that. You can do that, et cetera. It's your data. So I think um, some some vendors in this space and tech vendors in this space will struggle when those requests kind of hit. So I think you're particularly well suited with your work in the UK to say, okay, we can handle those kind of requests to be forgotten or to own the data. Yeah, that is that is a really good point. And the other thing that I've seen is just, is the um, the perspective and the thinking is so different around mm -hmm. uh, around. Um, the right to privacy and the yeah. ethics related to privacy. Yes, absolutely. Um, having said that, though, I really feel there is a lot of opportunities for institutions that do have um, sophisticated, sophisticated ways at looking at data and mm -hmm. um, utilizing those to really help their students succeed or uh, understand in advance what their students might need to, to succeed better. I think there's a lot of opportunity for more of that here. Yeah, I think so. I think so. My son is 21. I asked him 
whether he was worried about data privacy. And he's like, no, as long as you make my life better, I'm okay mm -hmm. with it, right? <laughs> right. Yes. So um, he was just worried about the outcomes. So right. you have this, he's like, his argument was, if you have this data about me, you have my data, you should be able to give me personalized information. You should be able to target um, interventions where appropriate. You should be able to let me know or improve my engagement, going back to the mm -hmm. topic of discussion. He's like, you should be able to know that because you already have this data. If you're not, you're failing. It's not, I'm not failing. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we've seen more of that, I would say, in the um, e-commerce world, <laughs> perhaps, yeah, right. than in other areas of, of uh, society. Mm -hmm. so, so um, Shannon, um, yes. we had one, sorry, one other question I just wanted mm -hmm. to get in there from our sure. chat was, um, it was specific to Biblio, um, and it was asking um, how the data from um, Biblio, so for, I guess digital content, um, can it be combined with data from other areas such as um, student scores and that sort of thing? It can, it can be combined and is being done at several of our clients uh, via an API. Uh, and then they take the data and feed it into their own uh, data warehouse or data lake uh, and use um, their own dashboards to combine the data from various sources. Do you have examples of that, James, where you may have seen some sophisticated use of, of data analytics? Yes, I have. And I think there is still, um... Yes, and I think to go back to your point before about the capacity of doing that institution, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard, it's tricky. Um, you also have data quality concerns, right? Because not all of these right. bits of data share, for example, the same definitions. Um, I worked in a, for a Department of Education in K-12 and they had 10 definitions of school. Um, and so trying to pull data from different sources when you have differing definitions of something is tricky. You also have questions of um, timeliness, some of it's older, some of it's newer, et cetera. So you have the capacity issue, you also have data quality issue, but we are seeing institutions kind of thinking and working hard to kind of pull data from a number of sources, combine it to get a system, to get a view of a student to know what steps to take next um, and know what levers to pull to help their student out as part of the teaching learning process. Yes, that's uh, that's the type of thing we see as well. So uh, in the next slide, uh, we uh, I wanted to talk a bit about BibliU's universal learning uh, uh, business model. Again, a very uh, exciting innovation that we've made based on input we've gotten from clients. And uh, the whole point in universal learning is to provide not only access, but also engagement. And we offer uh, for, we normalize the price to make it very inexpensive. So it's $50 per book uh, across the entire institution. And this is based on the institution's own book list, the books that faculty members have already selected for their courses, respecting their academic freedom. And we worry about uh, uh, normalizing the differences between the cost of content in the back end. So for example, you know, one course where element might be $130 and uh, another book might be $40 and another uh, uh, item might be $85. And we just normalize it to make it one flat price for every student. And that also makes it much easier for the institution. And the model is that we um, bill the institution and then the institution bills the student through their bursar account. So it ensures every student has a book for every class. Uh, it's affordable. Uh, it, we found it lowers the cost for students overall, 30 to 50%, depending on the uh, content they're using today. And as I'd mentioned before, it can be used on any device, say a phone, a tablet, a browser, on a, on a desktop or a laptop computer, offline or online. So with COVID and institutions closing um, and going online, uh, many institutions we've spoken with talk about how they've provided either um, hotspots for their students or they just have students come and park in the parking lot 
get the use the wireless there uh, to and could sync and then go and work offline. So um, there have been a lot of creative solutions for providing broader access for students. And uh, we also um, work with over 2000 publishers. A uh, great example uh, would be Jackson College in Michigan, which is a community college. Their um, traditional bookstore that they had was not able to provide the type of flexibility or cost they were looking for for their students. And we were able to implement them institution-wide. They have about 6,000 students uh, within six weeks. So the process was they gave us the list of courses and content. We uh, if, uh, had most of that in our database. What we didn't have, we procured in digital format and uh, worked with them to uh, put the links in their learning management system for the students and do uh, training um, and communication campaigns for both the institution and, uh, I'm sorry, the faculty members and the students. Uh, Shannon, we had just one question um, related to the universal learning, um, which was about the bookstore. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the, gen the question was, how does universal learning wor work with the bookstore? Do you have any examples of that and what has worked for others? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think, um, you know, the bookstores um, provide different functions on different campuses and uh, if uh, the bookstore, many, many institutions um, uh, find their bookstore is a very important integrated part of the campus. Uh, it's a meeting place that provides um, yeah, spirit wear, for example. And, uh, and in those cases, we can work with the bookstore. In other cases, a bookstore might not be serving campus needs. It might be unprofitable. Some have become even more unprofitable. Um, during COVID because the campuses were closed. And in, um, in that case, Bibli, you could be a pathway to evolving from a classical bookstore model, which, uh, which is more oriented around um, print books. Um, also, uh, an uh, instance that uh, occurred recently was um, at Wichita State University tech uh, so the community college community and technical college associated with, with wichita state university their bookstore closed it was being run by the parent the wsu the bookstore just they it was announced they would be closed uh on their campus and they really had no no alternative other than to send students to amazon or to another campus and in that case we were able to implement a pilot in the fall for them quite quickly. And then uh, it went so well, they're accelerating and uh, implementing all their gen ed courses for January. Mm. James, uh, what are your um, experiences uh, uh, getting feedback on bookstores? Are you hearing much about that from the, the work you're doing at Edge Ventures? Uh, a little, I mean, I think we're, you know, we we did some, you know, you mentioned kind of elephant in the room, right? COVID. Uh, we looked at the institutional responses. We looked at about 500 institutional kind of websites when we started in the midst of COVID. Um, and they were primarily focused on getting the faculty up and running with the use of tools. In fact, almost two thirds of what we looked at were faculty focused and one third was student focused. Right, so it made, but it was all about making sure students understood the tools, which was fine. It was all very tool based. Very little of it was about access to physical content or engagement at all. Right, so mm -hmm. there was this big push as the wave of COVID hit, just to say, let's get let's get ready when it comes to these tools, proctoring, LMS, um, digital content, etc. Let's get that going, and then. Think about engagement, physical content, bookstores secondarily. Um, and I think the pendulum is swinging back. I think people are now considering what that looks like, what engage, what, what COVID has actually taught institutions about preserving student engagement, about the role of physical spaces, and the need of physical spaces in bookstores. I think there is that consideration happening now. Um, but from the outset, it was just, hey, let's just get ready on the tools and let's go. Um, and let's just make sure that works fine. 
before we worry about engagement, advising, physical spaces, et cetera. That was somewhat secondary. Um, and I think that's that's now a focus of many institutions, at least the ones we're talking to. That makes complete sense. And, you know, I just spoke with an institution recently, uh, community college, and a very uh, major area of concern for them is what they called the frictionless experience. Mm -hmm. So the ability for students to get what they needed easily without the technology getting in the way where they could get to the learning materials and move through their courses. And uh, that is, uh, I think, continues to be an uh, area of concern and what uh, I think relevant to what you were just, just mentioning. How do we make sure they don't, because uh, the student will give up <laughs> eventually. They said they'll do whatever they can and then they'll give up. So I mean, it will be like a lot of, like many or all kind of large scale events, kind of pressure test you. Right, you say, okay, was I ready? What, what gaps do I now see? And I think the ones you're mentioning, the frictionless experience, engagement, advising, access to physical, um, uh, physical spaces, physical bookstores, other areas, uh, internet, things like this are now being highlighted as, as some institutions realize that they weren't quite ready in those areas. They weren't prepared to, um, you know, when, when COVID actually hit. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how institutions kind of respond to that, mm -hmm. um, and the bookstore, the digital content and the engagement and what we're talking about here, I think is one area where institutions will begin to think about it more now. What does my teaching learning look, ecosystem look like if I have hybrid online, some variation, something like that? What does it look right. like if I prioritize enga engagement? What does it look like if I have digital content involved, all different types? What does it look like now? Um, so I think institutions are thinking about that a little bit more. It's, it's very interesting to see it out. I agree. And I think uh, what, uh, what, what furthers it is the fact that the uh, enrollments are continue to be down in many mm -hmm. cases. And yeah, so uh, it can, it, um, causes um, that reconsideration to, um, to extend uh, right. as yeah. a way to try and um, uh, engage the students that are there and help them to persist. Yes, right. Yes. Shannon yes. and James, I have two questions that are related to what you're just talking to, and I'll ask them both at the same time because they're kind of a similar theme, even though they're talking about different um, types of users, I suppose. Um, the first was um, asking about the adult learner and um, how to be successful with digital content for um, learners that are maybe um, didn't grow up as digital natives. And um, the second uh, question was related to faculty adoption and buy-in to digital um, if they're feeling uh, sort of entrenched in using print books for their um, class. I would say um, it's interesting with the adult learners. I think many adult learners who are online are becoming more and more familiar with digital. Uh, and so there's less resistance than, than one might imagine, I think. Um, the, I think the big challenge is how do they fit in uh, fit it in just like their courses. And um, one of the things that we offer to address the concerns about uh, perhaps a non-digital native, whether it's a faculty member or a student actually, is to provide a print alternative. Some, um, some people and some faculty members just don't like being told they have to go digital. They want choice. And that's understandable. Uh, and so uh, we offer print on demand. So if a student uh, prefers print, they can get a print uh, they can get a print copy and an inexpensive print copy uh, to be a companion for the digital copy. Uh, the digital can also be printed, but in some cases there are limitations on the number of pages that can be printed as part of the digital rights management that a publisher would uh, would impose. Um, the um, the other thing we do is we do offer a print alternative overall. If a faculty member says, I want my whole class to be print, not digital, we do have that as an alternative uh, for them. But um, in general, I think um, 
the adoption of digital has been pretty seamless. And I think having a print option uh, enables people to feel like they aren't being forced and then they're mo more open to making the change. And I think the faculty adoption question is interesting, right? I mean, we spoke to an institution some a while ago with a very, very mature um, online course offering, right? And they have a great instructional designer, they have wonderful faculty in the world, et cetera. And they were struggling to convince the faculty in in class, in person, you know, physical print um, textbooks that they had any kind of real value. I think this is going to change if and only if we don't consider online learning as just being a digital form of in-person learning. As Shannon mentioned earlier, you can do a lot more, right, in the digital sphere than you can before. I know um, I can, I could, I can now, and a lot more using digital content. I mean, I came in loving physical books and hating the idea of having to read large text online. But now that I realize I can do annotation, I can do a lot of things in a much better and more efficient way than I could with digital, with physical, um, it's, it's changed it for me. So I think we're seeing some institutions begin to sort of try to distinguish between the two and say, this, this has a unique offering or unique set of offerings, digital, and you might want to take, a, take advantage of that. Um, it might be important to help your pedagogy, to help your students' success as well. But as long as we see it as just, well, it's just regular teaching online. I don't think faculty, I think there's a room there to, to, to Shannon's point, but faculty would say, well, look, I'm gonna stay with physical, right? Why would I change if all you're doing is the same thing I'm doing, but via a computer, <laughs> right? There's no change. <laughs> and you're like this, but if there's something different, then you can talk to me about it. So I think we're seeing that a little bit more. Right, and I think also just the, the uh, point I made uh, earlier about the um, adult learners at the University of Phoenix wanting uh, text-to-speech, they wanted to be read to, and you can't have that with print. So I, th I think that's a great way that um, you could identify a, a non-digital native um, uh, adapting the um, medium to what they need. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you, Josie, for going to the next slide. So um, what, what, uh, so what is key to success with a digital first content strategy? And that's a little bit about what we were just talking about. Yes. Uh, and I feel like uh, a, key, a key part of it is um, integrating all the pieces that do make it unique. And part of that is the analytics and the engagement that you mentioned, James. Uh, I think a lot of institutions also are going to uh, a flex mode after COVID where students can choose. They can do online if they prefer. They can be in person if they prefer. And I think being digital first uh, supports uh, these, new, uh, these new ways of working that have come since COVID. Um, a big part of it, I think, is planning to make it successful. You have to cover all exactly. the content, let all the faculty members use the content they chose in the first place. Don't, don't insist on changed adoptions right off the bat and um, provide a lot of um, training and support to make it as seamless and frictionless an experience as it can be. What are your thoughts? I'd agree. I would add one additional, I agree with everything you just mentioned. I would add one additional thing, which is what's the ultimate outcome of this, right? Um, you know, you don't want to start on this strategy to solve today's problems. You want to start on the strategy to solve tomorrow's problems, right? You want to figure out what you're doing going forward. What kind of institution do you want to become? Uh, how do you want to help students? How do you want to create and build in flexibility so that you, if you have to make another pivot and God forbid another COVID-like thing, but some pivot, you're, you've got some adaptability, right? You've got some scalability. Just to think about where you want to be and how digital fits into that. And then everything Josie mentioned, you know, integration of certain types, planning, capacity building, all of that is important, but this strategy isn't to solve today's problems, it's to solve tomorrow's problems. Very well said. Thanks. 
So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you'd like some additional uh, resources, we have a universal learning white paper, uh, which was um, with the, uh, to which the forward was written by Ellen Wagner, whom some of you may know, and also a blog where we've got uh, a variety of content published on a regular basis. Thank you. And I'd like to um, thank Shannon and uh, James for thank the you. really uh, informative content today and great discussion. Thank you so much.